Hello there, and welcome to Friendship Alliance Church. My name is Jason. I'm the pastor here. I want to thank you so much for joining us for church today. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of James. We're going to continue this journey that we've been on, uh, exploring uh, the book of James chapter by chapter. And today we are going to wrap up chapter four today. So that's where we're going to be. I just want to say hello to everyone. It's, it's just incredible to see what God is doing and how we are connecting with one another. So you got people in Ohio watching this, uh, people uh, that used to attend here that have moved on and uh, that still stay connected and engage with us, and uh, people from uh, India, to Alaska, to Africa tuning in. It's just, it's just pretty incredible just to see that, and uh, we're just so great to have you, and this is the unity that we can have with one another. So I want to say hello, thank you for being a part of this uh, just church family. So with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and uh, explore James uh, chapter 4. We're going to wrap that up. But before we do that, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for this time. And I pray that you would stir our hearts and lives today with your word. Uh, it, it says your word is alive and active, living and active. And I pray that that's what this message would be in our hearts and lives today, living and active. So much of what your servant James is teaching us is practical ways to put our faith into action. And I pray, Lord, that we would truly live out our faith as, as ambassadors of you, as a, an example of you, Father. May we take that role upon us and take it seriously and take it with us wherever we go, not just putting on a, a face or a, on a Sunday morning, but may we be ambassadors for you every day of the week as we go forth in our jobs, homes, communities, Father. Uh, we thank you so much, Lord, for all that you are. We praise you. We give you glory. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So James chapter 4, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it, starting in verses 11 through 12. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So right off the bat, James always being direct. Do not slander one another. In other versions, it will say, do not speak evil uh, of one another. To, to speak evil, to, to speak that slanderous speech can, can ruin the reputation of another person. Uh, the, the impact of slanderous, evil speech, it can really change a life forever. I'm reminded of Richard Jewell. Who remembers Richard Jewell? Put it in the live chat if you remember him. Uh, back in 1996, he was a security guard working at the Atlanta Olympic Games where he discovered explosives and was able to clear a good part of the area away from the explosives. And he was first considered a hero for finding the explosives. And then he became a suspect. And then the news ran with it. And several news outlets pinned it on him for this heinous, evil act. They put the blame, they put the guilt on him. And while he was later exonerated after the actual bomber was identified, he, his life, he would say, would never be the same. In 2021, there was a monument honoring Richard Jewell for, uh, that was put in Olympic Park in Atlanta for his heroic efforts in, in limiting the loss of life. There was one individual that lost their life, but it could have been way more individuals that perished that day. But back to, back to James here, back to James. Clear and direct as usual. James is saying, look, don't, do not slander, do not speak evil of one another. And then he adds to that. He adds to that. He says, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister judges them, uh, or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. So James is saying here is that not only is there a potential of ruining someone else's life with evil, slanderous speech, but there you can also ruin your own life by doing so. I mean, he says specifically here, the person who slanders speaks against the law, talking about God's law. And, and, and you are not keeping God's law and you are judging it. That, that can definitely ruin your own life there, couldn't it? But remember, 
James's readers here, his audience in his letter, was to early Christians from a Jewish background, a Jewish heritage, who, because of that, they had a high respect for the Old Testament law. So this, this what James is saying here, would really catch their attention. Uh, the law that James is most likely referring to here is found in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Let me share this verse with you. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone from among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That sounds very familiar to what Jesus would tell us later are the two most, most important commands, right? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. To love your neighbor as yourself. So, so speaking against a brother or sister is an obvious violation of the command to love your neighbor as yourself. And in addition to that, as I was thinking about this, in addition to that, can you, can you really say that you are loving God with all of your heart, all of your soul, with all of your mind, if you treat his image bearer in such a way, when you're judging a creation of his. Now there's, there's one word, one word that you see more than any other in verses 11 through 12, and that is the word judge. Judging is often the byproduct of when fighting and arguing are taking place, which which obviously was taking place when you go back to the beginning of chapter 4, when James is like, what's causing this fighting and quarreling among you? And there's a quote that I read in preparation for this. It says this, when you judge another, you do not define them, you define yourself. There's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? Judging another person is a way of putting yourself above the law when you look at this text again. We are not to be judges, and when we do, we place ourselves above the law of love, the law that God has established. God is the only judge. He is patient. He is understanding. He is also just, and he is holy. Amen? And because of that, we can put any matter where it would be quick to judge. We can put any matter into his perfect hands instead of casting judgment with our imperfect hands. Amen? So with that in mind, I want to give you two tips. Two tips that I, that I read in preparation for this message that can help you and I. And the first tip is this. Before you judge, make sure that you're perfect. Okay? So there's tip number one for you. Before you judge, make sure that you're perfect. And, and good luck on being perfect because I'm certainly not perfect. And I'm, I'm guessing you aren't either. So before you judge, make sure that you're perfect. Tip number two. Tip number two. Do not judge just because they sin differently than you. Do not judge someone just because they sin differently than you. Man, we see this all the time, don't we? In comparing sin in judgment. It's like, oh, I'm, I, I know I'm not perfect, but so-and-so over there, oh man, you could see what they're doing? Oh my goodness, I, you, you hear about this all the time and we can be easily guilty of it as well. But it goes back to the truth that there is only one who is perfect. And it is not you and it is not me. It is God alone. There was a, there was a pastor that was invited to preach at a prison. And he accepted the, the invitation and went to the prison. And he had an audience and all these inmates are, are gathered around him. And the first thing that he said to them was this. The only difference between you and me was that you got caught. That was his first words to all those inmates. But there's some truth in that because we've all sinned, haven't we? And all sin breaks God's law. Judging someone because they sin differently than you makes zero progress, zero progress in either party experiencing God's mercy, God's love, God's grace. When you, when you judge someone, like, does it lead them any closer to experiencing God's love and grace? No. Are you, gonna, are you drawing any closer to God when you are judging someone? No. Absolutely not. It simply, it simply isn't our role to judge. May we walk in love and humility with God and with each other. God, because God is the only judge 
that you and I and our neighbors will ever need, right? But with that said, it, it, it's easy. It can, it can be so easy to judge. We can be so quick to judge. So there's, a, in our community here, there's a, a lot of people that have second homes. And there's a little known fact about Katie and I is that, uh, that we also have a second home. I, I, I know, the, not too many people know. We, we have a second home. You might be wondering, how much are they paying you? But anyway, the, uh, our second home, it, it's called Hank's. And that is the, the local grocery store here. It's definitely our second home. We were there all the time. With five kids, they, they just eat us out of the house. And it, we're just constantly going to Hank's all the time. And Hank, is, Hank loves us for obvious reasons. But anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm at Hank's. And it's the beginning of the school year. It's a grind. And, you know, the kids are eating us out of the house. And sometimes it, it's hard to get the lunches together because they're picky. Like, oh, I don't want to buy what they're, they're making there. That, that lunch sounds gross. And so, but then we don't have anything around the house to pack a lunch for them. So sometimes as a parent, you get desperate. Sometimes you get desperate. Sometimes you go to Hank's and sometimes you grab a stack of Lunchables. Like you just, you have to do it sometimes. I know they're not great. I know they're not good for you. Sometimes as a parent, you do the Lunchables. Let's, let's be honest. You just go that route sometimes. So anyway, I'm at the grocery store and I'm in that desperate state. It's a grind to trying to get the lunches all figured out. So, you know, I grab a little stack of Lunchables because sometimes you do the Lunchables. So I go to check out and there's a gentleman behind me. There's a gentleman behind me and he's looking. He's like, oh, I've never seen these before. I'm like, oh, they're, they're called Lunchables. I'm just trying to, trying to get through the week and pack my kids some lunches and and then he looks at me in disgust and he, he, he holds up one of the Lunchables and he's like, did you see how much sodium is in here? And I'm like, dude, I'm like, I know. I know these aren't good for me. I'm desperate. I'm just trying to get through the week. So quit judging me. Quit judging me on my, on my Lunchables. So what do I do? I didn't say that to him. So what do I do? I look at what he's getting, right? I look at what, what's going, what he's putting on the little conveyor belt of the waiting in line. And do you know what he is purchasing? The only thing that he is buying is five candy bars. I kid you not, I counted them. It was a Milky Way Twig. I don't know. He bought five candy bars. And here I am, I'm like, I'm trying not to judge. I'm trying. It's so hard. I'm like, you're going to judge me for my lunch, but I'm going to judge you for your five candy bars. It's so difficult sometimes not to judge one another. It really is. But let's get back here to verse 12. There is only one lawgiver. There is only one judge. The one who is able to save, the one who is able to destroy. But who are you? That's what James asks. Who are you? Who are you to judge my lunchable? Who am I to judge his candy bars? Who are you to judge your neighbor? God is the lawgiver. He is the judge. And since he is the great I am, the alpha, the omega, since God Almighty gave the law, he alone is qualified to judge. Amen? So to wrap up his point here, James, James really kind of makes his readers feel the full force and scope of what he's trying to convey to them when he asks them that question, like, who are you? Like, who are you to judge? With his typical bluntness and directness, he's telling believers, look, know your role. That's why he's really, like, know your role. Your, your role. It, your role is not to judge your neighbor. Your role is to love your neighbor. That's what he's saying. Like, who are you to judge? It's not our role. It is God and God alone. We are called to love our neighbor. Amen. But one final thought before we move on to the next point here is that I want to speak into the character and, and nature of the one true judge, God alone. Because so often people that look at Christianity from the outside looking in, just look at, okay, God is just waiting for, for me to mess up so he can pour his wrath upon me. And I want to say that absolutely God, there, absolutely with God, there, there, is, there is judgment and there is, there is judgment for those who reject him. It says God is able to save, God is able to destroy. Absolutely, there is judgment from God. But, but I want to highlight two key areas with regard to God being the judge. I want to, I want to 
give a couple of characteristics that are really vital to the kind of judge that he is. And one is what we looked at last week and the truth that God gives more grace. That, that is so, uh, just, the, the, just the idea of that God gives more grace grace. That, that gives us hope, doesn't it? That, that, that God is, he, he wants to give grace. We looked at reconciliation. We looked at repentance last week, that, that if we confess our sins, he is willing, he is faithful, he is just to forgive our sins, cleanse and purify us from all unrighteousness. He is a judge that gives more grace. So there's some encouragement for you today. And then here's the other characteristic that I want you to know about the kind of judge that he is, and that God is a patient judge. Amen to that. Anybody thankful today that that God is a patient judge? Let me give you some scripture that backs that up. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's what he longs for forever. He wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to experience his grace, his mercy, his love. He is patient with you. That's the kind of judge he is. He is a patient judge. He's not just waiting for you to mess up so that he can smite you. He is waiting for you because he longs for you to come to repentance. Remember, we talked about the cycle last week with repentance comes forgiveness and with forgiveness comes reconciliation with God. That relationship with God is restored. So with that said, are you, are you ready to take a hard turn with me? Because that's James's writing style. He likes to make those hard turns. So we, we just looked at how, looked at how James's warning about, about arrogantly judging one another. Now we're going to really shift gears here and we're going to look at the arrogance of thinking that we control the events of our lives, that we have total control over the events of our lives. That's what we're going to look at next. So look with me now in verses 13 and the beginning of verse 14. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. Why? Why, James asks. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. So let me, let me ask you a question. Anybody watching this? Anybody have a planner? You, know, you have a planner, maybe it's a notebook, or maybe you have a planner app. If you're watching this with, uh, with the live chat, put it on there if you have a planner or a planner app. So here's what I, wanna, I want you to do. Do me a favor, okay? Don't throw it away after reading that, after just hearing that. Don't throw it away. Don't delete your planner app, okay? James is not saying that planning is sinful or foolish, okay? In fact, preparing and planning is brought up continually in Scripture. Let me give you some. Let me give you a quick lightning round of uh, Scripture that backs up pr- planning and preparing. Let me share with you a couple of different proverbs here. Proverbs chapter twelve, verse five: The plans of the righteous are just, but the advice of the wicked is deceitful. Proverbs fourteen, verse fifteen: The the simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps planning and preparing. Proverbs 21 verse 5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. And the last one, my personally one of my favorite ones, Proverbs 16 verse 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. So if, if plans aren't the problem, then, then what is the problem? The problem is taking God out of the plans or not even inviting God to our plans and making it about self, making it about our own ambition on our ability alone. Once again, Proverbs 16 uh, 16 verse 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do. Whatever you do, commit it to the Lord and he will establish your steps. There is no committing to the Lord in in the example that James gives us here in chapter 4. And when you look at this section in, in, the, in the broader text of the verses that we have explored up until this point, it really fits into the topic of the two different kinds of wisdom that we looked at at the end of chapter 3. 
There was the world's wisdom that was based upon envy and selfish ambition. And then there was God's wisdom, which involved being pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, etc. So, so what kind of, when you look at the example given in James chapter 4 here, what kind of wisdom is being shown here? Like, I'm going to spend a year here. I'm going to spend a year there. I'm going to carry on business. I am going to make money. It's all based on the world's wisdom, isn't it? God has no place in these plans. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead a little bit in the text and we'll circle back to the end at, at the end of verse 14 at the end of the message today. But look with me in verse 15. There's a direct response here to what is taking place. James says this, Instead, you ought to say this, If it's the Lord's will, we will live this or, or do this or that. If it's the Lord's will. Notice how he puts God back in the plans. And I I love that. I love how James lays this out. I love how clear-cut and practical it is. Like, here's what you ought to do instead. Here's what you ought to say instead. Like, can I be real with you for just a second? I wish there was more verses like this, to be honest with you. Just like, okay, this is what was said. This is what was done. Here's what you ought to do instead. Here's what you ought to say instead. It's just so clear-cut and accessible there. It's just so easy to grab a hold of. But once again, notice what James is directing us to do. Put God in your plans. Put God in your plans. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Don't be led by arrogance. Instead, be led by God. And this is something that James is clearly not seeing from his audience when you look at verse 16. As it is, James says, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. So I want you to ask yourself today, take an honest look at yourself today. And ask yourself, what, what do my plans look like today? What do my plans look like today? And who is at the foundation of my plans? Is it God or is it just me, myself, and I? And then out of nowhere, in classic James fashion, he makes a, a very profound statement in verse 17. He says this, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do, and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And obviously you can look at this and, and, and what we have looked at up until this point, but he's speaking in a much broader scope, isn't he? He's speaking in a much broader scope. And it can become real easy. It can become real easy to get into the pattern of hearing scripture, listening to scripture, watching another message without making any changes. Not not doing the, the good that we know that we're supposed to do. And we can, we can ponder the big ideas and discuss them, and, there, and there's great value in that. Don't get me wrong. But James is telling us that, that if all we do is think about it, if all we do is listen to it, if all we do is discuss it, and, and never become a doer of the word, never doing the good that we are called to do, then it is sin. James is saying, look, in a really jarring way in verse 17, that failure to act, failure to do the good you know you're supposed to do, is in fact an act, and that act is sin. Faith in action is more than attaining knowledge. It is doing and acting upon what a believer knows is good. Amen? And that time, the time to do so, is today. Because time is precious. It is a gift from God. And with that in mind, let's go back now. Let's circle back to the end of verse 14 where James asked the question, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Like we, we truly have no idea what will happen tomorrow. And we're not, we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. I don't care how many safeguards you have put in your life. I don't care if you are the healthiest person you know, have this underground bunker, whatever. You have all this, all these safety measures in place. You're not guaranteed it tomorrow. You're simply not. Life here on earth is temporary. It is fragile. We are truly a mist, as James describes us. Now, James is not saying this to be a Debbie Downer. By the, by the way, what's the male equivalent to a Debbie Downer? There are a lot of male Debbie Downers out there, aren't there? Uh, Derek Downer, let's go with that one. A lot of Derek Downers as well. 
But anyway, James is challenging believers to embrace their human limits, not trying to live this life on their own, and to carry with them the awareness that every moment, every moment, church, is dependent on God's grace and God's timing. And the, the present truly is a gift. Amen? And the time to live for him is today. The time to put him in your plans is today because we truly are a mist. And, and to be completely open and transparent with you, this, this topic here, this idea of us being a mist, it's, it's, a, it's an area I've been struggling with personally. And uh, I, I'm going to be on vacation next week and uh, next uh, next Sunday I turn uh, I turn 44 which I, I know that doesn't sound that old but I, I've been younger as I always tell everyone but but 44 has been really messing with me and the reason be, the reason for that is because my my dad never made it to 44 he passed away when he was 43 and he was always kind of this larger than life figure in my life. I mean, I was taller than him, but, uh, but he was this large, he was a big, you know, a big guy and, uh, you know, he was strong and, uh, but strong in his faith as well. I'll just, I will share with you this quick story. And, uh, there's this, um, I played church softball with him for a couple of years before he passed. Uh, we had a great time doing that. I have lots of church softball stories, but anyway, there was this one time where he hit a home run. He hit a lot of home runs. But he hit this home run, and the other team was upset by it. And uh, they went up to the umpire, and they're like, check his bat. Like, they thought he was using an illegal bat. They took their church softball seriously there back in Norwalk for a while. But anyway, they're like, check his bat. And so the umpire kind of rolls his eyes, and he walks over and picks up the bat, and then he walks over to the, uh, to the team that's accusing him. And he says, did you guys see his arms? Like, those should be illegal. His bat is just fine. So anyway, there's a, there's a quick story. There was a, you know, a big, strong guy. But anyway, the, the idea of me, like, outliving my dad has just been really messing with my head. And, and honestly, like, I didn't think I was going to make it to 44. I know that sounds crazy, but I didn't think I was going to make it to 44 because I didn't see my dad do it. My, my father-in-law passed away at 46. So I just, I, I haven't seen like anybody, they, my father, my father-in-law, I, I didn't see them live a long life. So I just kind of fell into that trap, just waiting for the worst to happen. I, that's what I've been kind of waiting on in certain aspects. And I, I want to tell you today that we can, we can get trapped up. It, we can easily get trapped up and waiting for the worst to happen. And, and it really stops us in our tracks. It really does. It, it's truly a, a way that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy any kind of momentum in our life. But, but what did Jesus say in, re, in response to the, the enemy coming to kill, steal, and destroy? He, sa he says what? I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what he wants for you and I today. May we truly embrace the grace. Embrace the grace. Embrace the life that we are blessed with today because we are a mist. We aren't guaranteed a tomorrow. We may not know what tomorrow brings, but we know the one who holds time in his hands. Amen. And at our in-person service, we're going to close off with a song called Held in Your Hands, and I encourage you to check it out. I'll put it in the video description. But in the words to the song, the, the main chorus says, all of our yesterdays, all of our tomorrows are held in your hands. All we know to pray and all we've yet to face are held in your hands, God. Held in your hands. Our hope, our, our future, our salvation is secure in his mighty, powerful, merciful hands. Amen, church? Amen. Would you join me as we close together in prayer? Father, we, we've covered uh, different areas, different topics today, Lord. And I pray that, that you would speak into our hearts and lives in these different things that we have touched on today about making plans, about, about the, just the, the brevity of life. I pray that you would just make this aware in, in our lives, Lord, that we would live for you not tomorrow, but we would start living for you today. 
that we will put our faith in action today as you have called us to do. Father, I, I just my hope and prayer is that this word speaks into hearts and lives today. And I, I put it into your hands, Lord. We thank you once again for this time. We give you praise, glory, and honor. And it is in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us here at Friendship Alliance Church. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can stay engaged and connected with us. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all of our previous messages you can find on the YouTube channel there. There'll be links to all of these in the video description. Uh, all the songs that we do at our in-person service, right there in the video description. Check out that song held in your hands, by the way. Uh, a couple of things that we always say about Church Online. Uh, we believe that Church Online should be a shared experience. So uh, we, we encourage you to please like, share, uh, watch this with other people. We are, we are told in scripture to, uh, to not give up meeting together, to spur one another along towards love and good deeds. So we encourage you to do so. Uh, we also believe that uh, social media can be a mission field and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. So every like, share, every subscribe helps us to be active on that mission field as well. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be on vacation next week, so there won't be a new online message for next week. However, the following week, we'll jump back into chapter five. I'm going to take some time off, uh, celebrate my birthday. I'm going to actually go ride some roller coasters in Idaho. So uh, I'm going to go check that out, and I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. But uh, have an awesome week, church. Love you so much. May God bless you. <laughs>